To get into the gather and crunch the data piece, the first one up is the MIT living wage calculator. If you have not already checked out this tool, you should definitely do so and bookmark it. Not only is it helpful and is regularly updated for us to look at and be sure that we're aware of what cost of living is looking like, uh, what a livable wage looks like for our area. Uh, and we can also then use that to help advocate for paid internships, help advocate for new positions, that kind of thing. Uh, one of the newer items we have on here, the Consumer Price Index, that is a resource to use to help track the inflation levels and the percentage increases for a year like this year. This particular resource is critically important to make sure that you're aware of. As we go through every year, uh, for a more average year, it is still important to check, uh, but may not be as critical to the overall information. So for this year, definitely get to know it and have it just be a part of the tools in your tool bag, so to speak, for what to check annually. We're also going to take a look at firms with federal contracts. Uh, so firms such as myself, if we hold a contract with the federal government, that means that a good amount of our business and what we charge for that business is public knowledge and so we can actually find payment details for various services uh, for those provided to the government. There are then the government pay schedules and so these are the pay schedules for the people they actually employ in the government and they can be incredibly handy not only to help define position descriptions but then equate levels of pay at those different levels of position description. Then, of course, taking a look at job boards, Bureau of Labor Statistics, salary surveys. So uh, whether it's indeed.com, if there are some uh, specific museum registrar, what have you for your area to check out, then great. Um, otherwise, depending on the field you're in, museums, archives, libraries, there's usually always a salary survey within the last few years. Um, at least informally, not formally, that you can go and check out. And we have some links to the most recent ones for those fields. And then your current pay position description and position classification and those of peers. If you're in a particular organization where those things have been defined, then that information can also be used to help you in determining and collating essentially all of that information. So starting with the MIT Living Wage Calculator, this particular one is for Washington County, Oregon. That is where I am located. And so we pulled this a couple of weeks ago in the uh, left hand side of the grid inside the teal box. You'll see that it lists living wage, poverty wage, and minimum wage. So these are the three tiers that you will find in the majority of the resources in the MIT Living Wage Calculator. Um, they have a few other grids per locality that you can get into the details of, but these are the, the three boxes that we want to make sure we're familiar with. Um, first of all, minimum wage, that's the law. You should definitely be aware of what minimum wage is. Poverty wage is, depending on the states, can be lower or higher than what the minimum wage is. So that can be very interesting slash critical depending on where you're living. And then the living wage. So living wage isn't dictated by law. It isn't um, indicative of averages of wages. What it is indicating is what it costs to actually afford to live in a given locality. And so you'll notice for this particular area, while the minimum wage is $12.50 and the poverty wage is $6.19, in order to actually live in this area to afford it as one adult with zero children, your wage should be $21.60, which is quite a bit more than the minimum wage. And of course, that has knock on effects for every position, even if you're above minimum wage, um, it still, of course, is going to impact you if living wage increases but your actual wage is not matching that increase. And we'll get into that some more with the inflation resource. So 
So consumer price index, um, this is the main place, there are many places you can go first of all, but the main place to start at least is with the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So this is like the official starting point essentially for gathering all of the types of inflation data points. And I just wanted to grab this headline for you here from their website. And it was posted July 18th, 2022. So just a little over a month ago. And the title is Consumer Prices Up 9.1% Over the Year Ended June 2022. Largest increase in 40 years. And then, of course, getting into the statistics, uh, this is from the same website, but you see I've gone on uh, next to the first teal arrow. This is the Western Information Office. So again, uh, for myself, located in the West region, this is the inflation chart for that region. Go and check out your own regions because they'll be a little bit different, even though inflation is being tracked nationally. Of course, that's going to look differently locally. And so down in the second teal arrow area, you'll see the chart starting June 2019 to June 2022 and how uh, when COVID happened, you'll see that little bit of a dip in the stats there lasted a few months and then, of course, nothing but uh, a steep incline on inflation since March 2020. So. It has been a steady incline and it has been really felt, especially this last year. Um, so this is all to say this is going to factor into a lot of the math we're going to look at in this webinar. All right, speaking of inflation, when we last did this webinar, that was in January 2021. So less than two years. <laughs> And you'll see on the left hand side calculation for Multnomah County, Oregon, which is where one of our major urban centers are, city of Portland, and the living wage at the time was $15.16. And so at least somewhat within the same bracket, though separated by a few dollars of the minimum wage at the time, which was $11.25. Since then, Checking it now for Multnomah County, Oregon, the minimum wage has gone up. Oregon has always been a very pro, well, maybe not always, but certainly in recent history has been fairly proactive about increasing minimum wage quite regularly. And so the minimum wage now is $14.75. The living wage now is $21.60. And so between the two, you can see minimum wage went up. It's that $3.50, if I, my quick math is correct. The difference from $15 to $21 is six plus with the change, et cetera. But it is even more so than minimum wage is increasing. So in this regard, even though minimum wage has increased quite a bit compared to other states, it is not even close to the accelerated weight uh, rate of needing to live up to that living wage increase. So this is just one of the examples of where we're seeing that cost of just astronomical inflation happening um, and showing up in these living wage charts. Here's another thing for us to take a look at. Um, one of the contracts of firms that you can go and take a look at because it's a federal contract is from the history associates incorporated company they had and i say had past tense because it ends in september of this year they had i think what was essentially a five-year contract um, and so the prices that they have listed on the right hand side those were the prices locked in over the course of the five-year contract that whenever the federal government used the contract for history associates. These were the associated prices, depending on the project and who was working on it. Now, what will this mean for what it looks like for the next five years? I am very curious to find out because these prices, of course, were calculated and proposed. If it was a five year contract, it would have been done 2016, 2017, depending on how far ahead they had to send the proposal in. So 
That means History Associates at the time was working with data from 2016, 2017. Not only is that a long period of time for a contract, there's going to be the normal slash usual uh, cost increases for cost of doing business. But now we have this <laughs> president sentine, um, almost historical levels of inflation for just this year. So what is the contract gonna look like for next year? I don't know, but I would expect at least a 9% increase and that would be just for history associates to stay even with the inflation from this year. That's not counting the inflation from 2017 to 2021. That is just counting the 9% of inflation for this year. So if we're taking their rates that they proposed and locked in with the 2017 start of their contract, we're then now adding a 9% increase just to cover inflation. This is not even like uh, increasing for other costs of business, because of course those have gone up at the very least because of inflation. So there are several factors here, inflation just being one of them as to why history associates should be increasing their prices. By how much though? I'm not sure. One of the things at play here is that when you're going for government contracts and as a firm that does this i am very aware one of the scoring areas is price and typically it's whoever's the cheapest instead of whoever has the best proposal and the price is equated with that value of work it's whoever has the best proposal hopefully the best experience and who can undercut themselves the most it is not a healthy system, but it's the system we have. And so I will be very curious to see how History Associates balances the very real cost of doing business and how that has increased with trying to still be competitive and still securing those government contracts. Knowing, of course, once they do submit the contract, assuming it's gonna be another five-year contract, they'll be locking themselves in to whatever those rates are for another five years. Uh, also, because the History Associates uh, contract should be up in September this month, that when they do have a new contract, keep an eye for it. We've linked to this current contract, but depending on when you're watching this video, et cetera, this is how you can find it, like literal Google search, GSA, which is General Schedules Assembly, I think, uh, federal, arm of the federal government, and then just put in History Associates Incorporated. You'll see it should usually always be like a PDF file. It's like link number four on here. So if our link doesn't work for whatever reason, you can always also go and find it yourself uh, fairly easily. All right, switching to government pay schedules, which means it is staff employed by the federal government, not a firm, not a contract. This is actual staff. They use a position classification system. Uh, if you're working for any sort of municipality or if you're working for any sort of company that's large, you will typically have some form of this and have it, whether it's position classifications, position descriptions, um, something in that flavor of lingo. Given that we're talking about libraries, archives, and museums, there's a few different classification schedules that you can go and check out. You'll see I have uh, screenshots of three of them that are probably the most applicable for this group. The first one being the 1420 series, that's for archivists. The 0170 series, that one is the history series where you'll typically find more research um, history orientation. And then there's a librarian series, which is the 1410 series. So um, go and play around with, if you're not like a librarian or an archivist, um, go play around with the schedules to see which one has the best fit for you. But um, as the government, they have pretty much every sort of classification under the sun. So you should hopefully be able to find something that will work for you. Uh, two things that are very helpful here. The first one and what I point out on the right hand side of the screen is that the classification 
gives you like the literal defining of that position. So you have the nature of the job, the nature of the work, and then uh, like for archivists over here, the 1420 series, you'll then notice there's the dash 05, dash 07, dash 09 through to 13. Those are the increasing levels of archivists by years accrued, experience accrued, responsibilities held, et cetera. So not only do you have that base level description of what is an archivist in this case, but you then also have the add-on descriptions of what level of archivists there are and what that looks like in terms of experience and responsibilities held. The other area where this is supremely helpful is that there's a pay schedule. Everything is very transparent here. It's the federal government, which is um, why that is and makes it very nice for us to always have updated annual numbers. Um, this is especially true for our fields where there may not be a salary survey, certainly nothing formal every year, which we'll get into those in just a moment. But you'll notice on the left hand side of the screen, we have the from the OPM branch of the government, we have a pay table and we've got it based per locality. And so depending on what the closest locality is to you, you can take a look at the various rates, whether that is an annual or an hourly rate. And because of how the federal government has set up its classification system, it doesn't matter necessarily that you're an archivist versus an engineer, for example, what matters is the grade. So for archivists, they're the 1420 classification, but we then saw the grades for Dash 05, Dash 07, Dash 09 through to 13. That's what we're looking at here. So if you're an archivist 1420 living in this case in the Chicago area, um, let's say you're a Dash 09, so you're just out of grad school, a little bit of experience maybe, your annual starting salary for the federal government is $60,840. It is that straightforward. These are great tables to reference because at the very least, it gives you up-to-date numbers annually. Do keep in mind, it is the federal government, and so the rate at which they pay if for better or worse could be higher or lower than what the market rate is and we're going into that area of information very shortly. But at the very least it's a data point that is dependable it is updated regularly and it is very easy for you to go through and find what your pay should be and at an hourly and an annual rate. Speaking of salary surveys, um, not a whole lot has come out since the 2019 conference seasons. That's where a lot of these informal salary surveys started to come out. Um, this particular slide was a leftover from the last webinar and I left it in here because we were seeing based on the data provided in 2019 and then compared to past surveys and in this case, a census of like 2006 or something that adjusting for like cost of inflation, et cetera, the, the commanding wage rate, our wages were still going down. The actual like bang for the buck was going down. So major devaluation happening for archivists, but of course this is pervasive for libraries and museums as well. Um, so already not looking good, and this is prior to the pandemic. And as of a few days ago, of course, before recording this webinar, a census two came out. So I gave and have given the Society of American Archivists a pretty hard time over the last few years of how irregularly this survey is done. In fact, in the actual article, it says it's been 17 years. Um, not for lack of trying, to be fair to them, they have tried to seek federal funding through like IMLS, but this is really something that needs to be done more frequently, I would say even annually, and is something that should perhaps be budgeted for by this group, but that's just one archivist's opinion. This data has just come out 
there's so much in here i have not had a chance to digest it all but i did want to point out that you can go and look at it for yourself even if you are not an archivist there are some trends that the authors of the survey have identified that will be parallel and perhaps insightful for your field as well so it is worth poking around i did want to point out here that we are seeing still the majority of archivists in this case being stuck in the basically sixty thousand dollars or less club and this is irrespective of how many years of experience and it is just really disheartening to see this was um, this particular number bracket was something that came up in the uh, salary survey of 2019 that I had brought up. This is basically has stayed the same for 20 years, at least since I've been in the field. So um, again, I haven't had a chance to dig into all of the data yet, but I am not pleased just to see how stuck we still are especially when inflation is so high. All right, market research, because not all of us can work in the government or want to work in the government. There are, of course, the tried and true websites that everybody can go and use. Um, for Google, for example, just Googling, I need a library job while looking for the INALJ site. They are now, they is, and Google, are now coalescing jobs as part of your Google search results. And I was pleasantly surprised with how appropriate a lot of their results were in this particular area. So um, I recently discovered that. Maybe it's just a me thing, but if you did not know about this, definitely worth checking out. There's the regular job boards, LinkedIn, Monster, ZipRecruiter, Indeed, etc. Those can be somewhat helpful at least while they don't have all of the library archive or museum jobs they will have at least a few that you can narrow down to your state or uh, regional level there then of course is both the regional and national job boards for whichever organizations you are a part of that many of them have their own job boards that you can go and check out there are then the i need a library job archives gig museum savvy um, some of the more privately ran uh, job board lists that are, I believe all of them actually, are still freely available to anybody who needs to go look and find a job. So um, all of these sites together can be very informative for you to go and check out on demand to see what sort of jobs are out there, first of all, and how much those jobs are commanding what is a nice trend and something optimistic to share with you all is that because of a lot of the salary advocacy that started happening well let's be honest salary advocacy has been happening forever but there was quite a good bump of momentum in 2019 going into 2020 and many of the regional organizations have shifted to a salary range being required for job posts we are finally starting to see some of the national organizations require that too, um, it, which means for us that we have even more data to play with when we're looking at these job posts. So that's all to say, go and check out um, the various different market research, government, job classifications, just even more data for you to crunch.